Be open, receptive, supportive, not judgmental, analytical, shocked, or surprised. And along with this, as much as our heart reaches out to this child, as much as we want to take them into our homes <laughs> and keep them from ever being hurt again, we have to be careful not to make promises you can't keep. You know, don't say CPS will come and this will happen and this will happen, because I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. You can be there for that child then, but be careful of promising them the world. If it never happened to you again, I wish that were true. <laughs> but I can't say that to a child. They are trusting you, so you need to tell them things you know. Um, we use open-ended prompts, and then what happened? Verify that information by repeating and not interpreting. That's a difference, okay? We had sex, so he did this, this, this to you? That's not, that's, that's paraphrasing, that's interpreting what they're saying, not repeating back. For your purposes, it's important to make just enough, uh, gather enough information to make the report, okay? So you need to know who did this, when the last time was, those sorts of things. You don't need to know about everything that happened, just enough to decide whether you have a suspicion. Um, I also would encourage you that after the child has disclosed, write everything you can remember down. Um, it's easy for me because I tell the child up front, I'm going to ask you some questions, and because my memory is terrible, I'm going to write down everything we talk about. I tell them that in the beginning. But in your scenario, if you're just beginning to develop this theme with the child, it can be very distracting to write it down. So I would encourage you afterwards to write down how you ask, because that's very important, how you got the information, how are things going. When I ask how, do, how are things going, she said not so good at home. That sort of thing, write that down. Um, and again, that's important because what we really want to know is that you were not soliciting a disclosure, which can be difficult to interpret if you solicit a disclosure. Um, also, again, make sure they know you're available, need to talk about their feelings or have questions, give them very specific information about how to contact you. Uh, be very careful about how much you tell the child or the family member about um, CPS and law enforcement. Now, there's an exception with the HIPAA law. If a parent, let's say, for example, you're with a child and a parent asks you, what did you guys talk about? If you feel that telling that parent could jeopardize the safety of the child, you do not have to do that. In my scenario, that happens a lot because we have children that come in more with physical abuse because we don't know who may have abused the kid, so we don't release information to the parent. We let CPS do that at their discretion because they hold more information than we do. They can make that decision. Does that make sense? So HIPAA allows you, it gives you an exemption. You don't have to talk to the parent or release written information if you think it could jeopardize the safety of the child. If you have a non-believing parent, or you have a parent that may be the abuser, those are the scenarios where release of information could jeopardize the safety. Does that make sense? Okay, and I, I think you guys have these numbers, but I just put them up here. But, you know, our Texas law says you can report to CPS or law enforcement. I think in general, what these folks would say is that if you really feel you need emergent intervention, you call the police because then they can move that child to a hospital setting or a safe setting, um, but otherwise you can call CPS. They talk to each other. They do interchange information, so that probably if you report to one, the other will get it. There's the CPS hotline number. There's the SAPD number. So in general, um, remember that sexual abuse is unfortunately a common problem of childhood. There are a number of different methods that sex offenders use to secure silence. And again, a lot of that is geared towards cultivating the child's fear, guilt, and shame that they won't tell. It's not unusual for children to wait months or years before telling. And remember that that disclosure is a process. It's not a single event. Um, encouraging disclosure is best accomplished by showing children you are concerned, knowledgeable, and trustworthy. I tell parents that they need to have regular conversations with their, parents, with their kids. We are so busy these days and sometimes so absorbed with our social media that we forget 
about the conversation. And what I would tell parents is that we're very used to kids coming home and say, do you have a good day, dear? Yeah, mom. Well, that's good, honey. Go do your homework. Why don't you ask what was not good about their day instead? So they start practicing and knowing that I can talk to mom, or I can talk to my friend about things that made me feel funny. I, and I can guarantee you most kids during the week at school have witnessed or seen bullying. Get them to talk about it. How did that make you feel? What kind of things do you think could have been done? The point is that they need to identify you as a person they can talk to about anything, not just the feel good stuff. Practice touch and base about things that don't typically make us feel so good at times. And that's just, this is just one of my favorite quotes. Children are the guests of humanity and should be treated with all honor, care, and kindness. Um, that's the end of my talk on this topic. I do have some more slides that I can, uh, I'd like to show you just about our Center for Miracle Services. I know that I think on your way out there's going to be a little handout that you can get that would tell you how to contact us. Okay, so I'm just going to share with you a little bit. Um, while I'm switching over, are there any um, questions about anything that I presented here? I have a question. Yeah. Is there a uh, <coughs> Um, I understood there was, and I thought there was a change to the law. I guess what I would encourage you to do is that if you become aware that child abuse or sexual abuse has happened, to go ahead and report it and not worry about the statute. Because the way that the law was last phrased, to my understanding, and I'm willing, if somebody else has more knowledge about this, um, is that the statute does not really start until the victim realizes that what happened to them was reportable abusive. So for some people, that happens in therapy in their 20s. And that's what I understood is when the statute begins. So I guess I would encourage you to report and let the system figure out whether it's past the statute um, of limitations. Does anybody else have any different information about that? Yes. The question had to do when is the statute of limitation for reporting. You know, if you think about the Sandusky uh, trial, a lot of those individuals were adults and talking about things that happened 10 years ago or more. So that makes me think that at least in most states, that's still true. Is the statute runs when you come to the understanding that what happened to you is a crime. And that some children don't know that, even until their later adolescent years or adults. And then something, they receive information that makes them realize that was reportable, or I could have, you know, so that, that's what my understanding was. So I guess to kind of firm up the question, you have a teenager who gave a history of sexual abuse and is now recanting. And I guess what I would ask is, in what kind of a role? As a therapist, as a... You know, I, I guess what I would consider is giving them additional things to percolate about. One study suggested that about 90% of kids that recanted actually reaffirm their original disclosure eventually. And I think that study looked at one to two years after the recantation. So they, they kind of went back and looked and after recantation, two years later, how many reaffirmed, I think it was about 90%. So that's just one study. Um, so there's still hope, I guess, is the way to deal with it. Um, I think usually kids that we can't direct encouragement to reaffirm what they've said usually doesn't work. What has to work is something else that comes into consideration, something else that helps them weigh it back over to this side. I, I can understand children that we can't completely, especially young children who lose their families. You know, the, the mom believes the perpetrator, so the child is removed and maybe in foster care or maybe with another relative, and they recant because they think they can bring it back to the way it was. And I understand that. I, I, I feel extremely bad for those children, and I, um, I won't push them 
because I need to have the disclosure, <laughs> you know. But for therapeutic reasons, I think I would just let it on the table and I would give them some things to think about, about why it might be important. Um, there are a couple of analogies I use when I work with children, and one of them has to do with a splinter. Uh, this is actually not my idea. I heard this in another presentation, but I tell kids that are reluctant to talk to me or have only given a little bit. I say, you know, a lot of this is like a splinter. It really hurts when it's in your finger, and it hurts a whole lot when you pull it out, but then it starts to heal after that. So I give them that little bit of analogy. Um, another thing that I work with kids with self-blame, I ask them a question. I say, if you go to sleep at night and you forget to lock your door, does that give the thief the right to come in and rob your house? Still against the law. They can't do that. Even if your door is unlocked, they can't do that. And that, I think, helps them, you know, kind of readjust their perspective. So giving them some concrete analogies is sometimes a nice way. Yeah. Uh, do I have any surveys? Like um, for special needs, and you're talking about cognitively delayed children, and um, I don't have any surveys. Uh, we, we interview kids, and some of them are cognitively delayed, but we just interview them at the level that they're at. As long as they're at least a four-year-old, we will attempt to interview them and do exams. But, yeah. That 90% number stuck out means that we affirmed the original disclosure of what they recommended. Um, yeah. What's the average length of time that it takes for them to reaffirm? We, I don't, I don't know in my experience. The one study, I think the average was about a year. I think that, that's my recollection. It, that's just kind of a, a vague thing, but about a year. Yeah. So you, talk, um, you talk about in your, in your um, presentation today about uh, children disclosing to the mother and a lot about the mothers and the kids trusting the mothers. Can you talk a little bit about your experience um, where the fathers are involved I have a little trouble hearing because you echo, but you're asking about when children disclose to their fathers? Yeah, or, or what has um, your experience been with fathers reacting to when their child discloses? Okay, okay. Um, there's a wide range. I love it when dads come to our clinic because they usually are dads that are talking to their kids, but it's not very common. So a lot of what I know about how fathers react are coming from the moms. In our community, what I hear a lot is he's so angry he can't even think or talk about it. You hear that a lot? He's so furious he can't even think or talk about it. Um, I usually try to encourage mom, I say, I know that you might not be able to get him in for counseling, <laughs> but that child doesn't know how to interpret that. And for some it means they don't believe or they're mad at them. That's how they're going to feel about it. So at some point we have to find a way for the dad and the child to talk. But that's some of the, the bigger problems that I deal with, but unfortunately I can't talk to the dads directly. They don't come in for the appointment. They don't want to hear about it. <laughs> they just don't, they're so angry. Um, sometimes we have dads that are so angry, I'm going to kill them. I'm going to kill them. You know? Probably police aren't going to do anything. I'm going to kill them. And we, again, try very hard to think, try to help them see the child's perspective on that. Okay, you will go to jail <laughs> if that happens. You won't be accessible or available to support your child if that happens. But some of those, the, some of the dads will actually tell us that. Then we come. Um, in our clinic, a lot of times the social workers are working with the mom while I'm working with the child. So they will ask about marriage and how this has affected the marriage and the stability of the marriage. Um, but again, a lot of our work with dads is more indirect. 
I can't tell. I can't say anything. Those are very difficult cases. With the evidence, unless the child can tell us who, it's very difficult to go forward on that um, in terms of the criminal. Okay? We, um, for medical, and I'll be honest with you, my primary role is as a clinician. It's not as a forensic examiner. <laughs> I, I'm here to find out the medical needs, the mental health needs, maybe help that child to some extent, I'm not a counselor, but I'm trying to show them different ways to see what happened to them, begin their healing. That's where my focus is. So when a child, even who's not verbal, I'm still going to address their medical needs. Um, so I would be very focused on that with that child. Sometimes play therapy with younger kids who are pre-verbal or handicapped children who are unable to verbalize is effective. But it gets a little bit would depend on what, um, what the evidence was, whether it's an injury or a sexually transmitted disease or whatever. Yeah. But that's what, when, when I'm doing my assessment, most of my diagnosis is focused on what the child is telling me. The exam is about making sure they're okay. That's how I see it. The therapy should be appropriate therapy, and you know, cognitive-based therapy has been proven to be very effective with these kids. So what I've told families is most importantly is to get with a counselor or a program that knows of these, um, this type of therapy, but also a program that has a lot of experience with sexual abuse. I think that's really important. Uh, a lot of our families just can't do it. And I think that's um, it's unfortunate, and those kids may have more risk. You know, as you probably know, what the research is telling us is the more trauma a child has during childhood, we call those the Adverse Childhood Event Study, which has been a wonderful tool for us, the greater the risk for long-term adult medical and mental health issues. So in addition to addressing sexual abuse, what we really need to do if we want to optimize the outcome for the children is to address all the other things going on in the home. It never happens in a vacuum. It's so rare that we see an, a family and sexual abuse is the only thing that's happened to that family. They're often dealing with a lot of other things. So doing what we can to minimize the risk for other adverse childhood events, if you will, uh, could go a long way also for that child's future.